Welcome to San Joaquin College of Law Today, a show dedicated to issues and events within the law school, which are of general interest as well. SJCL Today is produced by San Joaquin College of Law, a nonprofit law school in Clovis, founded in 1969 to provide quality legal education. Over 88% of its graduates have passed the California Bar Examination. More than a quarter of the practicing lawyers in the Fresno area are San Joaquin College of Law graduates. Welcome to another San Joaquin College of Law Constitution and Citizenship Day lecture. For his September 15, 2021 presentation, Constitutional Law Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis picked the topic, What is Critical Race Theory? How can we stamp it out and suppress the truth of racism in America? In the past, his topics have included, Is it constitutional for me to scream at town hall meetings so that no one else can be heard? And death panels are trying to kill my grandma. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Professor Purvis. Um, I'm sure many of you or all of you have been to Professor Purvis's Constitution Day lectures before, and he keeps you coming back for more. He has done them a lot of times for us. He also teaches constitutional law and business organizations at San Joaquin College of Law. And he has been part of our, well, he's been faculty chair of our faculty committee for many years. He's also served in the past as a research attorney for the fifth appellate district for the state of California. And he was the editor in chief of the Bar Passers Review Court, uh, course for a while as well. He is going to be speaking today about what is critical race theory, which I think is a very important and timely topic, one with a lot of misconceptions and biases. So I look forward to hearing his perspective and being educated myself about critical race theory. So I will turn it over to Professor Purvis. If people have questions, feel free to write them in the chat to everyone or privately to me, and we will make sure they all get addressed at the end. I'm permitting. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dean Tinarelli. I'm, I'm humbled. Welcome to San Joaquin College of Law's Constitution Day and Citizenship Day celebration for 2021. As always, I like to recognize local luminaries who are attending, led, of course, by our own Dean of Students, Tinarelli, who is acting as host and facilitator and doing a fine job. We have wonderful staff members who frequently attend Beth Pitcock, Missy Cartier, Diane Scooty, Kenia Garcia, and Professor Howard is here, Director Barreto is here. So I'd like to recognize you all. Justice Scalia, I am so pleased that you could make it. I think you have attended more Constitution Day presentations than anyone other than my lovely wife, Susan. Is that a new trident? It goes very well with your robe. I'm not sure everyone in the audience would agree with that, sir. Oh, I'm the only one who can see and hear you? Well, I'm honored. Good to see you again. The Arizona Senate Committee to Audit Treasonous Liberals in Fresno County ordered that the following statement be read prior to today's presentation. Quote, by continuing to listen to Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis, you agree to waive and abandon your right to vote in any federal or state election to be held in the future and to retroactively cancel and rescind any previous votes you cast from the beginning of time. Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis makes frequent use of sarcasm and irony. San Joaquin College of Law apologizes in advance to everyone offended by his remarks. The video you are about to see is a deep fake created by the deep state that will plant a microchip in your brain, turning you into a sheeple who will accept death by vaccination, leading to the complete fluoridation of the nation's water supply which we warned you about in 1945. Any opinions expressed by Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis are his alone and do not represent the opinions of SJCL, the state of California, the Impeach Anthony Fauci Foundation, or the United States of America, whose constitution we celebrate today. 
Those familiar with my Constitution Day presentations know that the titles I select for them are products of my penchant for irony and my contentious nature. I also have an irrational hope that some who take the titles literally will attend, quickly discover that the presentation is contrary to what the title suggested, and then have a come to scoff, stay to pray reaction to the information they receive. But the last several years have demonstrated beyond peradventure, as the justices used to say, that such conversions are no longer possible. I will therefore continue to preach to the choir by providing my simplified and inexact understanding of critical race theory and consider the Republican Party's objections to it. But first, I'd like to bring you a blast from the past. He doesn't, dear, I don't know, I think he's... A Dear Professor segment like the ones that opened SJCL's Valley Views on the Law radio show that Dean Atkinson and I used to have on KFCF 88.1 on your FM dial. In those days, I would fabricate emails by imaginary listeners and then answer them as a means of slyly inserting my views into the program. I must acknowledge that most of our listeners were imaginary, so the concept fit neatly into the reality of our media success. Dear professors, when I heard that you had the gall to appear in public again, Professor Purvis, I had to write to add to your humiliation at being so stupidly wrong about the events connected to the 2020 election. Your pathetic whining about Trump will never leave the White House and Trump will stage a coup proved to be the usual treasonous claptrap you have spewed since Constitution Day celebrations were first mandated for educational institutions receiving federal funds. Turns out Trump was not an autocrat. He made no attempt to remain in power and took no action to interfere with a peaceful transition to the Biden administration. I don't expect you to admit you were wrong because radical libs like you can never take the red pill. But I had to point out to your cuck, snowflake, libtard audience that nothing you say can ever be believed. Now that the Republicans are outlawing the kind of voter fraud that was used to steal the 2020 election from Trump, I can look forward to the day when social justice warriors like you are put in camps, and I don't mean summer camps, where you can get the treatment you deserve. Here is to the Second Amendment, the only part of the Constitution that really counts. And that email is from DeSantis Abbott of East Rabbit's Foot, Texas. Dear Mr. Abbott, if only there was a pill that people could take to sweep away the illusions and delusions that the human need to avoid cognitive dissonance has made a permanent element of American politics. I was wrong. Trump did leave the White House because his attempt at a coup was as inept as everything else he did. It may just be my pessimism after watching every advance, however small and progressive goals for the last 50 years to be followed by a conservative backlash that made things worse than ever. But I am convinced that the half step forward represented by the Biden presidency and the miracle in Georgia is already unraveling. According to the right, Biden is to blame for Afghanistan, not Bush, Obama, and Trump. The recall campaign said Gavin Newsom is to blame for COVID-19 and the wildfires, not climate change and the concomitant mega drought. Republican legislatures have been vigorously engaged in voter suppression since the Supreme Court decision in Shelby versus Holder eviscerated the Voting Rights Act, but they have gone into hyperdrive since the 2020 election relying on the 6-3 majority of extreme right Supreme Court justices to permit all sorts of restrictions on the right to vote, justified by a transparently false narrative of voter fraud rejected by over 60 court decisions and numerous Republican officials. The vision of a permanently Republican 
QAnon dominated federal government is something to talk about on a future Constitution Day, assuming it isn't changed to Trump Day. Today, an elderly white man will discuss a happier topic, racism in America. You can send another email next year pointing out how I got everything wrong again. I must emphasize that I have no expertise in critical race theory and that I present my understanding as an educated citizen trying to make sense of another of many efforts by the Republican Party to demonize people of color, diminish democratic norms and institutions, and energize the millions of Americans who support Donald Trump and seek to return him or someone worse to power. Long before you all were born, or at least many of you, in the 1970s, a scholarly movement among law professors and others called Critical Legal Studies arose. I used materials authored by Professor Mark Tushnet, a leading CLS author in a rule of law class I taught in the past. He criticized the customary and widespread view that the American system of justice was characterized by adherence to rules applied by unbiased judges who reasoned according to neutral legal principles to reach definitive outcomes according to law. However much this was a theoretical ideal underpinning the rule of law and the institutions created by the Constitution, Tushnet argued that in reality, judges were political actors making political decisions and pretending otherwise concealed significant flaws in government, particularly in the judicial system that contributed to unjust outcomes and hindered progress towards more fairness and equality in our society. I believe in many respects that the critical legal studies scholars were correct. Judges sometimes decide the outcome of cases based on their personal moral and or political beliefs, and then craft legal opinions that are actually persuasive documents filled with legal rhetoric intended to sway other judges to support the preferred outcome or to justify that outcome to the public. As I understand it, critical race theory similarly examines how our political and especially legal system addresses and adjudicates issues arising from differential treatment of persons based on race. Professor Paula Lance of the University of Michigan Ford School of Public Policy recently identified some important tenets of critical race theory in a publication I accessed on the university's website. Although she was writing in the context of population health science, an area of expertise for her, I found her information instructive. I am paraphrasing much of what she wrote. Tenet one of critical race theory, she said, race is a social construction. The way that race is defined and experienced is the result of social and political thought and actions that change over time. Tenet two, although individuals can indeed be racist, Racism and its outcomes are perpetrated in society through social processes above and beyond individual actions, including through cultural norms, institutional rules, and laws and regulations. Rather than focus on racism as primarily being a problem of person-to-person -person racism, critical race theory elucidates how institutions, systems, and policies can be designed in ways that reinforce, codify, and perpetuate the adverse impact of historical and ongoing racism on people of color. Tenet three, because the differential treatment of individuals based upon racial classification is embedded within social systems and institutions, including public policy and law, racism is commonplace. Understanding structural racism within our systems and policies related to education, income, housing, food, criminal justice, the environment, and healthcare matters greatly for addressing racial inequalities. 
I will give you all a moment to recover from these shocking and incendiary assertions. It is immediately apparent that the critical race theory movement will stop at nothing to destroy the white race by convincing our innocent white children that they are inherently inferior, thereby destroying their sense of self-worth and preventing them from functioning effectively and successfully in American society. Something like what American society has done to children of color for a few hundred years. But let's take a closer look at these critical race theory principles and see if they are as dangerous as they seem. The first was race is a social construction. There is widespread agreement among scientists that race has no biological significance in humans. As a scientific paper on the National Library of Medicine stated, 85% of genetic variation occurs within groups, while only 15% can be attributed to genetic differences among groups. It thus appears that critical race theory is making the startling assertion that differentiating based on race as to legal, political, economic, or social rights is unwarranted. And that where such a differentiation appears, it can be ended by changing the thoughts and actions that created and perpetuate adverse outcomes based on race. Who would dispute this? A person who believes that the white race is inherently superior to other races and that white people should have control over people of other races would disagree with this tenet of critical race theory. Perhaps the people who responded to an Associated Press poll in 2019 would disagree. 22% of Democrats and 51% of Republicans felt that a culture established by the country's early European immigrants is important to the United States identity as a nation. Or the respondents to a University of Virginia poll in 2018, where 35% of Americans, including 26% of Democrats, 29% of independents, and 51% of Republicans agreed that America must protect and preserve its white European heritage. And there is the Pew poll of registered voters in 2020, which showed 65% of those who identified as Trump supporters said that immigrants threatened traditional American customs and values. The president whose first and third wives immigrated to the US from Europe, but who complained of immigrants coming to America from shithole countries in Africa, might also disagree with critical race theory on this point. I think the America First Caucus disagrees with this aspect of critical race theory. Its policy platform states, quote, America is a nation with a border and a culture strengthened by a common respect for uniquely Anglo-Saxon political traditions, close quotes. This congressional caucus, the formation of which was announced by Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, which Representative Louis Gohmert was looking at joining and which Representative Matt Gates tweeted he was proud to join, appears to have been abandoned when the policy platform was leaked to the press. Other than the wonderful people I have just described, or those who support such people, I can't think of anyone who would contest the notion that attitudes about race are the result of social and political thought and actions that change over time. How about tenet two? Racism and its outcomes are perpetuated in society through social processes above and beyond the individual actions, including through cultural norms, institutional rules, and laws and regulations. Differential treatment based on race is a constitutional issue when done by a government actor and is addressed formally under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Because that clause applies only to state governments, the Supreme Court invented similar constitutional limitations on the federal government arising from the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause. 
The Supreme Court has held that in order to be an equal protection violation, the government actor must use a racial classification purposefully. That is, they must engage in differential treatment, at least in part, because of the race of the person treated differently. Imagine a state government that chooses to fund its free public education system through use of property tax revenues collected by counties. An examination of the public money available to various school districts reveals that some counties receive much higher funding than others. Further, the counties that receive the high funding have a predominantly white population, while the counties that receive low funding have a predominantly population of color. It would be extremely difficult to prove, and cases have rejected the argument, that the adverse impact of this school funding system on the populations of people of color are the result of purposeful or intentional racial discrimination. After all, there is no racial component to take a percentage of the property tax in these counties and use it to fund K through 12 education. But I believe critical race theory scholars assert that this is an example of how institutions, systems and policies can be designed in ways that perpetuate the adverse impact of historical and ongoing racism on people of color. I try to understand this insight in the following way. First, black people were enslaved and subjected to what was undoubtedly the cruelest system of slavery humankind had ever known. Next, there was a civil war that ultimately resulted in the formal abolition of slavery in the United States. Then the victorious United States government compelled the treasonous rebellious states to permit black persons to participate in voting and in government. Public support in the North later waned for keeping federal troops in the treasonous rebellious states and white supremacist Southerners using terrorist violence and political suppression against black persons, eliminated them from state governments and imposed a legal regime of racial discrimination that prevented most black persons from obtaining an education, decent jobs or any significant accumulation of wealth. Later, when despite these circumstances, some black people worked hard and became prosperous, white mobs murdered them and destroyed their communities. Now, returning to the school funding system I mentioned previously, it turns out that many black people cannot afford to live in the counties where commercial and residential property values are high. And thus the schools they attend lack sufficient resources to provide a high quality education to their children. Is it really a supportable or reasonable explanation that black people suffer these economic disparities because of some moral defect that inherently or otherwise they share by being black? Is it a Marxist attack on the white race to suggest that public schools in lower income areas with higher populations of color should receive the same funding as public schools in wealthier areas with populations mostly white? What about tenet three? Because the differential treatment of individuals based upon racial classification is embedded in social systems and institutions, including public policy and law, racism is commonplace. The third critical race theory tenet identified by Professor Lance manifestly follows from the second tenet, and it runs counter to what I believe is a very widespread view among political conservatives. This conservative view is that racism, at least as directed against people of color, has ended in America. We elected a black president. We see people of color in government and in the professions, not to mention the numerous artists, performers, and athletes of color who have achieved great success in their endeavors. In this view, America has at last achieved a colorblind approach to race and any attempt to remedy the current impact of historical racism is itself an act of racism against whites. This rosy view of present day colorblindness informs the super conservative justices on the Supreme Court as well. 
in Shelby County versus Holder, a 2013 decision I previously mentioned, a five justice majority struck down the preclearance requirement of the Voting Rights Act. Chief Justice Roberts wrote, quote, against the background of historic race-based discrimination with regard to voting rights, Section 5 of the Act required states to obtain federal permission before enacting any law related to voting. He then wrote that in 1966, application of the preclearance requirement to certain states made sense. We found that Congress chose to limit its attention to the geographic areas where immediate action seemed necessary, where voting discrimination had been most fragrant. Flagrant, I'm sorry, it's also fragrant. And then he stated, nearly 50 years later, things have changed dramatically. In the covered jurisdictions, voter turnout and registration rates now approach parity. Blatantly discriminatory evasions of federal decrees are rare. Census Bureau data from the most recent election indicates that African-American voter turnout exceeded white voter turnout in five of the six states originally covered by Section 5 with a gap in the sixth state of less than one half of 1%, close quotes. Justice Ginsburg and three other justices dissenting took a much different view. She wrote, quote, between 1982 and 2006, DOJ objections blocked over 700 voting changes based on a determination that the changes were discriminatory. Congress found that the majority of DOJ objections included findings of discriminatory intent and that the changes blocked by, by preclearance were calculated decisions to keep minority voters from fully participating in the political process. Congress received evidence that more than 800 proposed changes were altered or withdrawn since the last reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in 1982. Congress also received empirical studies finding that DOJ's request for more information had a significant effect on the degree to which covered jurisdictions complied with their obligation to protect minority voting rights. Close quotes. Shelby County versus Holder illuminates for me the critical race theory principle that recognizes the rarity with which overt racial animosity can be established in the manner required by the equal protection rules the Supreme Court has adopted during the long ascendancy of its super conservative majority. States that formerly openly and actively sought to suppress voting by Black Americans have been unable to use the traditional methodology of poll taxes, literacy tests, Ku Klux Klan terrorism and racial gerrymanding, and so particip participation by Black voters has risen. But the Supreme Court believes it is an unconstitutional interference with the sovereignty of the former Confederacy for the federal government to selectively monitor changes in state voting laws. What if the states adopt voting policies that adversely impact voters of color or voters of a particular political party, but do not explicitly mention race. As reported by the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights on its website, since the Shelby County decision, 13 states closed 1,688 polling locations between 2012 and 2018, with 1,173 closing between 2014 and 2018. Texas, Arizona, and Georgia closed the largest number of polling places. When a polling place closes or consolidates, there is a tangible impact on a voter's access to the ballot box. The number of polling places helps determine ease of access. Georgia closed 331 voting locations between November 2012 and June 2020. And in 2018, it had seven counties reduced to one voting site to serve several hundred square miles. 
Without a vehicle or access to public transportation, exercising your right to vote becomes nearly impossible. Through bureaucratic maneuverings, local officials can close or move polling sites to influence who is able to turn out. Because these poll closures go unnoticed, unreported, or unchallenged, there is no record of the votes lost. Since the Shelby County decision, states previously under federal oversight have implemented several anti-voter tactics to deny voters access to the polls. States have adopted strict voter ID laws, limited early voting and vote by mail, and restricted voter registration, often in response to high turnout from communities of color and other marginalized communities. Similarly, similarly, certain states have become more zealous in purging their voter rolls, defining the fundamental right to vote as something you have to use or lose. While major legislative change or dramatic voter roll purges make headlines, the quiet closure of polling locations is equally pernicious. In another example that arguably falls within the notion of systemic racism, Consider the treatment of black farmers by the United States Department of Agriculture. In 1997, black farmers brought a class action suit against the USDA, alleging racial discrimination against them in its allocation of farm loans and assistance between 1981 and 1996. The lawsuit, Pigford versus Glickman, was ultimately settled in 1999 the USDA agreeing to a consent decree that provided a somewhat complicated system for aggrieved farmers to file claims for compensation. The court that issued the consent decree stated that for decades, the USDA discriminated against African-American farmers by denying, delaying, or otherwise frustrating the farmers' applications for farm loans and other credit and benefit programs. The court also noted that the USDA disbanded its Office of Civil Rights in 1983 and stopped responding to claims of discrimination. 20 years later, according to Representative Bobby Rush of Illinois, co-sponsor of the Farm Subsidy Transparency Act of 2021, introduced in Congress on June 9, 2021, 99% of the market facilitation payments, which were made by the USDA to offset the effects of foreign retaliatory tariffs during former President Donald Trump's trade war, went to white farmers. <coughs> Excuse me. 97% of coronavirus food assistance payments made to address the COVID-19 pandemic went to white farmers. In 2017, the Center for Investigative Reporting revealed that white nationalist Richard Spencer and his family received $2 million in U.S. farm subsidy payments. At the same time, an eligible white farmer received $17,206 on average in commodity subsidies, while an eligible black farmer received an average of $7,755. These circumstances demonstrate that racism is systemic in that efforts to use the judicial enforcement of constitutional rights model accomplished very little to actually rectify the adverse treatment of farmers of color, which persisted long past a purported legal victory. Evidence of systemic racial bias is plentiful in the private sector as well. On September 2nd, 2021, Forbes magazine reported online that an investigation by the markup found lenders were more likely to deny home loans to people of color than to white people with similar financial characteristics. Specifically, 80% of black applicants are more likely to be rejected, along with 40% of Latino applicants and 70% of Native American applicants. On August 3rd, 2020, Zillow, the real estate website, reported Black applicants are denied a mortgage at a rate 80% higher than that of white applicants, according to an analysis of the most recent data from the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. 
The black applicants are more likely to be denied when they live in predominantly black areas. Troubling signs that despite recent encouraging progress in advancing black homeownership, the housing market still has far to go to fully heal the scars of a deeply unjust history. There are countless other examples of systemic racism, outcomes that cannot be effectively remedied using the constitutional standard of purposeful discrimination, often because the race-based adverse consequences are the product of many interrelated decisions made by thousands or even millions of actors. The Center for Public Re Integrity reported on September 8, 2021, that in 31 states, as well as the District of Columbia, black students were referred to law enforcement at more than twice the rate of white students. In 2018, researchers from Gallup and the Brookings Institution published a report showing that a home in a majority black neighborhood is likely to be valued for 23% less than a near identical home in a majority white neighborhood. This devaluation resulted in $156 billion in cumulative losses to black homeowners. The New York Times reported on August 25th, 2020, on the experience of Abina and Alex Horton, who sought an appraisal of their home for refinancing purposes. Ms. Horton is black, her husband is white. An appraiser valued their home at $330,000, which seemed low to the Hortons given the values of other homes in their neighborhood. A second appraisal was arranged, for which Ms. Horton put away all her family photos and replaced them with oil paintings of Mr. Horton's white grandparents. She removed books by Zora Neale Hurston and Toni Morrison from her shelves, and removed holiday photo cards sent by friends that did not show white families. When the appraiser visited, only Mr. Horton was present in the house. The second appraiser valued the home at $465,000, more than 40% higher than the first. Federal law prohibits home appraisers from discriminating based on race, religion, national origin, or gender and imposes on appraisers standards of unbiased ethics and performance. But how likely is it that homeowners in a protected class who suspect that their appraiser is inaccurately low will have the time, energy, and money to obtain relief by seeking enforcement of federal statutes or otherwise pursuing a judicial remedy? I emphasize that I am not a critical race theory scholar I don't speak on behalf of anyone who studies critical race theory, and I am a white guy giving a brief and incomplete overview of a complex and very important legal, political, and social field of inquiry. I do this because the Constitution promises that no person should be denied the equal protection of the laws, because the federal courts, particularly the Supreme Court, have failed in their duty to enforce that promise of equality and because as reporters and many others have sought to inform the public, the Republican Party is weaponizing a false narrative about critical race theory to stimulate anger and hatred for purposes of political gain. I therefore turn to the objections that Republicans have raised against critical race theory. You're thinking, Come on, Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis. Republicans are the people who told us that COVID-19 would go away by April 2020, that blamed Jewish space lasers for California wildfires, that said Hugo Chavez hacked voting machines to steal an election for President Biden. They claimed that COVID-19 vaccines are untested chip-injecting poisons that will kill you or your sperm, but that horseworming medicine will cure you. These are the people who describe Donald Trump's attempt to overthrow the government of the United States by force as a normal tourist visit to Congress. Won't they make the same outrageously, ludicrously false assertions about critical race theory? In a word, yes. And since I'm reading your minds, you're also thinking, 
it has been repeatedly demonstrated that countering Republican falsehoods with contrary evidence has no effect on Trump supporters other than to strengthen their support of him. Why bother to attempt to contradict them? Full disclosure, it's actually me thinking all those things and projecting them onto you, the audience, to alleviate my despair. In any event, forewarned is forearmed, as the old folks used to say, and you'll all need something to shout back at your MAGA relatives this Thanksgiving. How did a somewhat obscure academic discipline become the rallying cry of the army of destructive idiocy that the Republican Party has become? Christopher Rufo is, according to his website, quote, a writer, filmmaker, and researcher. I document the phenomena of critical race theory, homelessness, poverty, and other afflictions, closed quotes. An article in the New Yorker magazine published June 8, 2021, reported that Rufo became aware of anti-racism training being done by the City of Seattle Office of Civil Rights, and subsequently concluded that conservatives needed new language to fight the progressive racial ideology engendered by the Obama presidency. We needed new language for these issues, Rufo told the reporter. Rufo said, political correctness is a dated term and elites are seeking to re-engineer the foundation of human psychology and social institutions through the new politics of race. It's much more invasive than mere political correctness, which is a mechanism of social control, but not the heart of what's happening. The other frames are wrong too. Cancel culture is a vacuous term and doesn't translate into a political program. Woke is a good epithet, but it's too broad, too terminal, too easily brushed aside. Critical race theory is the perfect villain. Rufo believed that the term critical race theory was a political, a perfect political weapon because, quote, its connotations are all negative to most middle class Americans, including racial minorities. Strung together, the phrase critical race theory connotes hostile, academic, divisive, race obsessed, poisonous, elitist, anti American. Close quotes. On September 2nd, 2020, Rufo appeared on Tucker Carlson's Fox News Channel show. I'll pause a moment in case anybody wants to boo. And said, among other things, quote, conservatives need to wake up. This is an existential threat to the United States. The president and the White House, it's within their authority to immediately issue an executive order to abolish critical race theory training from the federal government. And I call on the president to immediately issue this executive order to stamp out this destructive, divisive, pseudoscientific ideology, close quotes. And lo, it came to be. Rufo was shortly thereafter contacted by Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows to assist in drafting a memorandum subsequently issued to federal agencies. The memorandum noted that, quote, it has come to the president's attention that executive branch agencies have spent millions of taxpayer dollars to date training government workers to believe divisive anti-American propaganda. Citing only press reports, the memorandum asserted that employees across the executive branch have been required to attend trainings where they are told that virtually all white people contribute to racism or where they are required to say that they benefit from racism. The president has directed me to ensure that federal agencies cease and desist from using taxpayer dollars to fund these divisive un-American propaganda training sessions. Accordingly, all agencies are directed to begin to identify all contracts or other agency spending related to any training on critical race theory white privilege, 
or any other training or propaganda effort that teaches or suggests either one, that the United States is an inherently racist or evil country, or two, that any race or ethnicity is inherently racist or evil. On May 14th, 2021, Republican Representative Burgess Owens of Utah issued a press release which announced he had introduced two pieces of legislation in response to the Biden administration's proposal to fund education programs informed by critical race theory. Owens stated, quote, the paired legislation, which includes a bill that would restrict the teaching of critical race theory within federal institutions, and a resolution that highlights the danger of teaching critical race theory in US schools, underlines the systemic racism and damaging philosophy, philosophy within this prejudicial ideological tool, close quotes. I wanted to include all of the comments made in the press release by other Republican representatives, but I will only present the highlights <clears throat> and I'll try to maintain a straight face while I read them. Representative Buck said, quote, Critical race theory is dangerous, anti-American, and has no place in our nation's schools. Children shouldn't be taught that they will be treated differently and have less opportunities because of the color of their skin. They should be taught the founding principles of our nation contained in the Constitution, that everyone is created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, closed quotes. This is obviously one of my favorite comments because Buck inserts language from the Declaration of Independence into the Constitution. <coughs> Representative Donald said, quote, critical race theory is a warped ideology that seeks to divide Americans and relitigate the sins of the past by pinning white Americans against black Americans which is counterproductive and doesn't belong anywhere near our children. America's history regarding race is troublesome and deserves the proper attention, but we cannot allow for the degradation of American values and culture through so-called equity training. In the 21st century, we must teach and learn from our history and swear never to repeat it, but we cannot use our past to divide us which is what critical race theory will undoubtedly do, close quotes. Representative Brooks said, quote, critical race theory is based on Marxism, an evil plague that threatens freedom and liberty. Marxism stokes division by fanning the flames of race, class, and gender resentment. <clears throat> critical race theory was dreamt up by Marxists as a tool with which to sell Marxism in America. People who believe that an individual's defining characteristic is their race are by definition racists. I believe in fighting racism wherever it exists, close quotes. And saving for last the best or worst, depending upon your level of disillusionment, Representative Boebert said, quote, we are the United States of America but critical race theory wants to make us the divided states of America. Democrats have always been after our children. They pushed for segregated schools in the 60s, and now they're pushing this critical race theory in our schools, which is nothing more than modern day racism. Democrats want our, to teach our children to hate each other. I'm proud to join my colleagues in this legislation and say hell no to this racist propaganda, close quotes. When conservative political discourse has been almost completely severed from evidence, science, reason, or even a passing acquaintance with reality, how does someone address such criticisms of critical race theory? The Republican Party asserts that people of color, presumably along with their liberal white dupes, have embarked upon a campaign of revenge for slavery, Jim Crow, and ongoing political and economic oppression 
to brainwash impressionable young white children, <clears throat> causing them to believe that they, the children, are an inherently inferior race to be forever subordinated to the all-conquering brown hordes. I knew this would happen. As soon as I saw the movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? I knew that the God-granted God ascendancy of the white race was doomed. According to today's Republicans, the party of Lincoln, which happily embraced Southern white Democrats after the latter had lost the battle against the civil rights movement, is now the party of racial equality. A recent Hill Harris X poll revealed that 75% of Republican voters said that white Americans are subject to discrimination. 55% of independent voters agreed. In 2017, a poll by National Public Radio reported that 55% of white adults believed that whites experience societal bias, but only 19% of white respondents said that they had personally been discriminated against. I must admit that sitting here before you on Zoom as a longstanding member of the white race, I want to say to that 19%, please describe how you have been personally discriminated against because of your race. Were you an unarmed person shot by a black police officer? Were you beaten on people on the be beaten by people on the street by people of color who blamed you for AIDS? Or was it when you could told you were told you couldn't wear blackface anymore, even though Marlon Wayans and Sean Wayans were permitted to appear as white women in the movie White Chicks? It is fun, but ultimately futile to crack wise about the oppression of the white race and about white Republicans who position themselves in their party as the champions of equality and constitutional rights. <clears throat> because like voter fraud, cannibal, pedophile Democrats, microchips and COVID vaccines, 5G Wi-Fi causing COVID, transgender females who transitioned only to get into the women's bathroom, and any of numerous other completely irrational conservative talking points, these false narratives do not rely for their power and persistence on being true or verifiable. Against stupidity, the gods themselves contend in vain. How do persons of goodwill contend with the perfect storm of cognitive dissonance, social media, and politicians who will do or say anything to retain their political power? I'm not sure that a despondent white male should offer an answer to that question. I'll turn instead to a dead white male for a response. Victor Frankel, a psychiatrist and Nazi death camp survivor wrote, quote, live life as if you were living already for the second time, and as if you had acted the first time as wrongly as you are about to act for now, close quotes. In our first life, if we were too busy or didn't care to vote, and Donald Trump became president of the United States, we'll make sure to vote in every election in our second life. If getting vaccinated and wearing masks was unpleasant or didn't align with our political beliefs, when a COVID mutation makes the present vaccines ineffective, we'll follow the science so millions more don't needlessly die. If we didn't support public action to ameliorate the continuing harm inflicted on present day Americans by our nation's history of racism, we will not accuse the people working hard to identify and correct this ongoing injury of perpetuating the wrongs our own malice and inattention permitted to fester. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Purvis. Uh, we have a few questions. Our first is from Ms. Arredondo. Is she uh, going to ask it? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. <clears throat> I enjoyed this very much. My question is, there is a lot of misconception about what critical race theory is. So how do we shed light on the issue with populations who are not open to hearing what it actually means? Well, um, that last thing you said is really critical because um, I think it's difficult to 
reason, let alone communicate with people who are committed because of politics to an opposite view. But you can point out that there is nothing in critical race theory that suggests that all white people are racists, that white children are inherently racist, or any of the negative things that the Republicans repeat to criticize critical race theory. Uh, and critical race theory, of course, has many practitioners with many different views. But I think the core, as I tried to indicate in my presentation, is that if all we do is say, file a lawsuit against a government actor and prove they intended to discriminate based on race, then much of what historical racial oppression has brought about in today's world will never be addressed in remedies. It will never even be recognized. And that's what critical race theory is trying to do. Thank you. Um, if others have questions they want to ask in chat, we only have a few minutes either to me personally or to all, feel free. I was gonna ask you, Professor Purvis, how you think, you know, what resources and how you, what the best curriculum you think is for teaching critical race theory. Um, I know when I teach at City College, I've used the new Jim Crow and the Color of Law, which are both excellent. But I wondered if you have advice on how to teach it at the law school level and uh, below in the elementary level. Well, as I indicated in my presentation, um, I did not do a deep scholarly dive into critical race theory because um, the outcome wouldn't have fit in the context of uh, the typical Constitution Day presentation. Um, so I really can't cite any works by critical race scholars, but um, for my own purposes, um, I used the internet and quickly identified numerous resources that describe critical race theory and link to um, a great deal of critical race scholarship. So uh, it, it's not a secret. Um, it, it's readily available. As I said, it, um, it can be very complex. It's, it's a largely academic theoretical discipline, but, but the, uh, the central components that I tried to illustrate here, I think could be taught at any level of education. And yeah, maybe, and I, maybe we should consider identifying a critical race theory scholar who might be willing to teach uh, a, 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 an elective class at San Joaquin College of Law. Yeah, and I mean, you're using, you know, Shelby versus Holder and other cases. So I think it's already obviously in your curriculum in important ways, even if it isn't labeled as such. That's Are true. there any other questions that people have before we adjourn? Oh, I do. Professor Purvis. Okay, so if we can teach about the dark times like the Great Depression, women's suffrage, slavery, and all those that happened in the past, then why is critical race theory the perfect villain today? Is it because it's happening now? And it's, is that why? And the other stuff happened in the past? Well, recognize that critical race theory as the perfect villain was a description by a conservative political operative who was describing an opportunity to lie about critical race theory in a way that would advance the fortunes of the Republican Party. So um, it, it is the confluence of uh, the Republican Party seeking a new culture war anchor to generate anger among their supporters. Critical race theory has been in existence as a formal academic discipline since the 80s. So it didn't just come about. It hasn't suddenly sprung into being. 
It's just that Christopher Rufo decided what a great lie I could tell about it and use it to make sure the Republicans win in the next election, and then got the ear of President Trump. And now all the other Republicans realize now we can say people of color are racists and are trying to destroy America with racism, which is so preposterously stupid, you think they can't possibly say that. But as I hope I illustrated, that's what they are constantly saying. Okay, well, thank you both so much for your questions. And I know you both have class uh, or two question askers at 630, but thank you to everyone for being here and to Professor Purvis for supporting um, many you know, people of color through education and discussion of this sort and our campus community at San Joaquin College of Law. My pleasure. And that brings us to the end of this edition of San Joaquin College of Law Today, presented by San Joaquin College of Law, a nonprofit law school committed to educational excellence and community service. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the position or views of San Joaquin College of Law. This program has been produced in conjunction with the Community Media Access Collaborative. We invite you to join us in the future as we explore issues and events within the law school which are of general interest as well. For more information about San Joaquin College of Law, please visit our website at www.sjcl.edu or call 559-323-2100.